So this is part two of Veronica Franco. When we too are armed and trained, we can convince men that we have hands, feet, and a heart like yours. And although we may be delicate and soft, some men who are delicate are also strong, and others coarse and harsh are cowards. Women have not yet realized this, for if they should decide to do so, they would be able to fight you until death. And to prove that I speak the truth among so many women, I will be the first to act, setting an example for them to follow. And that was written by Veronica Franco, probably around 1575. So in 1575, now aged around 29, Veronica published her second volume of her own poetry, which consisted of 25 poems, but only 17 of them are by her. And the rest are written by Marco Venier, who was a nephew of Domenico Venier, and other identified male authors. Veronica's poems represented and transformed her life as a courtesan. As an honored courtesan, Veronica lived quite splendidly. She played the lute and the spinet, and she was well-versed in the literature of ancient Greece, ancient Rome, as well as of the present. She mingled with thinkers, artists, politicians, and other poets. Her poems advertise these accomplishments and raise her much higher above those less educated women who were selling sex, who were the Kortsigena uh, Zilum. Also in her poetry, Veronica is openly erotic, even sexually explicit. And in one of her very first poems, she celebrates her sexual expertise as a courtesan and promises her interlocutor's desires. Um, so basically she promises to fulfill her reader's desires through her poetry. In her writings, she also undermines the traditional portrayal of women as beloved, as a beloved silent, distant, and cruel, unattainable woman. It is read in her Capitolo 16 that she, uh, she writes a fierce and persuasive response to three, uh, three obscene poems written against her by Marco Venier's cousin, Mafio Venier. Um, Mafio was, um, I think, another nephew of Domenico Venier, or he was the son of Domenico Venier. So she defends herself against Mafio's attempts to humiliate her in public, and she defends the women who are verbally or physically abused by male attackers. Now you can imagine that Mafio Venier possibly held a grudge of some sort against Veronica, maybe due to her in ignoring his attempts to seduce her, maybe because he did not have the money to pay for her services. Um, it is said that Mafio was not as wealthy as Domenico or Marco, Therefore, women like Veronica possibly ignored him, as they kind of had like a reputation to uphold. So in Veronica's Capitolo number 3, number 17, and number 20, um, that was either in her second or her, th it was probably her second book, yeah. Veronica echoes the rhetoric themes, figures of speech, and characters of the Latin writers Catullus, Propertius and Ovid. I hope I pronounced those right. <laughs> in these Capitoli, she speaks, however, in the woman's voice about the destructive powers of longing, desire, and jealousy, and the frustration of self-enforced exile. Veronica's third and final book of writings, titled Fifty Familiar Letters, was published in 1580. The first letter is in the book is written to King Henry III of France. Um, now, it's said that Veronica had an affair with him, um, even though it is rumored in history that he was actually very gay. But I think him having an affair with Veronica and other courtesans was probably just a way to hide the fact that he was gay. Although he was said to be a very flamboyant dresser, and um, he held what you call... Um, I want to say menage à trois, but I don't think it was called that. A menage à trois was um, 
normally a husband, a wife, and a lover living together. But let's just call it a threesome, okay? Um, he Or group sex. He, he liked doing that. <laughs> With men, of course. Um, and um, Capitoli number 22 was written to Jaco uh, Jacopo Tintoretto, who is a Venetian painter. And in this letter, she was thanking him for the portrait that he did of her. Now, I actually have a picture of that portrait. Let me just find it here. Um, Veronica had very few portraits painted of her, um, probably because um, it wasn't popular for courtesans to get painted. But if they paid for it on their own or if their, um, one of their patrons wanted it. So this is believed to be the portrait that he did of her. Um, Jacopo Tintoretto. I hope you can see that properly. Sorry, I got like the glare of the computer screen. There we go. That's better. So that's Veronica. Um, yep. So that's the one that he painted of her. That's the one that he she's thanking him for in the letter. Um, this is another portrait um, that is said to be her. Um, now, whether or not um, it was painted by Jacopo, I don't know. Um, there were many Venetian painters at the time. So, um, I know the, the camera color is in sepia, but um, basically this portrait, she's wearing a colored dress of, um, with white satin underneath, and her hair is actually red. It is said that Veronica Franco had red hair. And this is another one. Um, this is probably one of my favorites. Um, it was believed to also be painted by Jacopo. So you have Veronica in the nude and a servant or possibly another courtesan um, tripping over something on the floor and dropping her money. And Veronica is kind of giving her like a look, you know, you know, um, it's okay, um, you're excused type thing, you know. I mean, courtesans live quite fabulously, so they were treated like they were queens, you know. All right, so let's continue here. Um, so it is said that Jacopo was even the father of one of Veronica's six children, who was believed to have been named Achilles. Interesting name. Um, Veronica's letters have a great biographical value. They show her in a range of daily activities, such as playing music, sitting for a portrait, making dinner for friends, or even engaged in a literary project. So through her letters and her writings, um, we're able to find out kind of around what kind of life she led besides selling sex for money. So they also comment on the events and situations represented in her writings. In some of her writings, she even gives advice to her male friends and even to a mother who is thinking of making her daughter a courtesan. Um, she probably, um, most mothers probably would have looked up to courtesans and said, you know, I'm going to make my daughter a courtesan because they have such freedom. Um, well, they... They, they were in a cage, courtesans. It's just their cage was much bigger than a, a regular Venetian citizen's cage would have been. Um, so, okay, so that's it for part two. Um, be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.